You are listening to the Visualizing War podcast. In each episode, we talk about representations of war in art, text, film, and music. With new guests each time, we look at how people have described or imagined war in different periods and places. And we discuss the impact which war stories have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Alice Koenig. And my name is Nicholas Vieta. And we co-direct the Visualizing War project at the University of St. Andrews. Our topic today is strategy making, not just how it's done, but how it's represented and how descriptions of strategy and strategy making shape how we visualize wars themselves. With us to talk about this is Professor Phillips O'Brien, who joined the School of International Relations at the University of St. Andrews in 2016 as Professor of Strategic Studies. Phil also directs the university's interdisciplinary Institute for the Study of War and Strategy, which has some obvious areas of overlap with the Visualizing War project. His interest in warfare and strategy range widely with a particular focus on the early 20th centuries. Phil's first book examined the Anglo-Japanese Alliance 1902 to 1922, the first agreement of this kind between a Western and non-Caucasian nation in the modern era, why it succeeded and why it ended. In 2015, he published How the War Was Won, Air Sea Power and Allied Victory in World War II, which shifts the focus from land battles, which are conventionally seen as characteristic of the Second World War, and argues that naval and air battles were far more decisive. Most recently, in 2019, Phil finished his biography of Admiral William D. Leahy, Roosevelt's chief of staff, and to quote Phil, the second most powerful man in the world, who became de facto president of the United States when Roosevelt's health started to fail. What unites Phil's work is an interest in grand strategy and strategy making. And that's what we want to talk to him about today, how people in the past have visualized strategy and how visualizing strategy shapes how we visualize war. So Phil, thank you very much for taking time to talk to us today. Hello, and welcome to the Visualizing War podcast. Great. Thanks, Alice, and thank Nicholas. So to start off our conversation, Phil, I was wondering if you could tell us and our listeners a bit about what a professor of strategy does. What does your research focus on? Professor of strategic studies is really what we'd call about government policy of strategy. It's the study of it's not military history per se, because it crosses the line to foreign policy. It can even be about war prevention. It's, in my case, focused mostly on grand strategy, which is the upper echelon policy making of states to achieve long term objectives uh, or long term interests through the use of government policy. That's both internally and externally. So it's, it's not war. War is certainly a part of it and can be a part of it but it's also about preventing war. And ultimately it's about policies that you try to put in place. That if you look at a strategy, what's interesting about a strategy that we have in many ways within strategic studies, which is what I do, there can be, I think a somewhat simplistic understanding of policy and strategy based on what I'll call the Clausewitzian notion. And the Clausewitzian notion means, okay, we have an aim. That's our thing. We know what we want to be. And what strategy is, is a way to use ways, i.e. often military force or soft power or diplomatic standing, those are your means, in certain ways, i.e. you take your means and you employ them to achieve aims. And that sounds really straightforward and interesting and nice. The problem I think I find the more I study it and what I'm interested in strategic studies is it's a far more messy process than this. And the connection between means, ways, and aims is actually, in many cases, quite tenuous. They don't work together. So what do I study? I study chaos um, <laughs> within the, the, the strategy-making process. That's very interesting. And I'm sure we're going to dig more into that and sort of idealizations of strategy. So you say, obviously, not all strategy making and not all strategic studies are about war, but you do also head up the university's Institute for the Study of War and Strategy. And I wonder if you could just introduce that a bit to our listeners, too. Well, the Institute of Study of War and Strategy is actually, in St. Andrew's terms, relatively recent. Um, it was founded fewer than 10 years ago. And it was to combine specialties from across the university. And war touches on everything. Sometimes, of course, we think of war as little boys playing with toys. But war is one of the most fundamental experiential aspects of the human condition. People who actually experience war are not the soldiers, though they do, but more people experience war as civilians. They suffer from it. 
they are deprived by it, their lives are shaped by it. So what we wanted to do in the Institute of Study of War and Strategy is combine um, throughout the university our specialisms in war, and they come from subjects such as classics, from psychology, from computer science, and history and international relations, and then combine this sort of wide ranging specialties with also what we might say, a more rigorous understanding of strategy making and how war is waged to have a well-rounded picture of war and strategy. Often what places they do is they have very small specialties that don't interact together. And what we thought we tried to do within the Institute was have a place where the different specialties could interact and, and learn from each other. And I, I found that to be extremely refreshing to me. The one I mentioned earlier, I've, we've started working in the business school on strategy. And it's opened up huge numbers of doors for me intellectually to hear how, when they talk about war and strategy, and they do, it's interesting that, that businesses and management or institutions talk about war and strategy. In many ways, I would argue a more sophisticated understanding than certain people who do strategic studies. So that's just one example of the kinds of interplay we have across subjects. That's really interesting. And uh, two things in particular that I'm picking up on here that are also very important to what we're interested in in the Visualizing War Project. Uh, one is this kind of broad vision of war that you're talking about, where it's it's not just about battle. It's not even just about the war itself from the beginning to whenever it ends, but it's very fuzzy around the edges. And there are lots of different parties concerned that all deserve studying and that deserve attention. The other thing that I found very interesting and that I wanted to follow up on a bit is you were saying earlier, you're studying chaos and the complexities involved in trying to understand how a strategy works. And I wanted to ask you about this. So in your books, you've been looking at fairly large scale events, the, the mm. Anglo-Japanese Alliance, the Second World War. And uh, I was wondering whether you could tell us a bit more about how strategies manifest itself in, in these events. What are we looking for? And how can we sort of visualize strategy uh, as it were? Where, where do we see it in concrete terms in these events? What do I mean by chaos? Well, I'm going to start with an example because it, it's something that occurred to me over time as I did my work. When I started working on the book, How the War Was Won, I had a quite a functionalist understanding of what strategy was. Uh, and that was going to be looking at the Second World War to see how the great powers put into place coherent strategies to see in the war. Now, if you're looking at, say, one example, we'll take the United States. The United States has a policy in the Second World War, has a strategy, a stated strategy. It's a strategy that's actually announced before the war begins. It comes out of staff discussions in the United States between the White House and the armed forces in 1939, 40, 41, and then theoretically put in place when the war begins. And that overall strategy is called Germany first, so Europe first. And what is that strategy? The strategy is, okay, here is the United States looking at this great global war that it's going to get itself in. And it's confronted by uh, um, you know, two different theaters, different halves of the globe that require very different types of war. You have Germany, Nazi Germany and Europe, and you have Imperial Japan and the Pacific. The Germany first strategy is like for us to triumph in this war, to basically have an American style peace to put on the globe, we need to first defeat Germany. So the, the strategic assumptions of, of this is that Germany represents the greatest enemy, much more so than Japan. So you need to defeat Germany first, because once you defeat Germany, Japan is helpless. I mean, Japan can't win the war. Germany might be able to win the war, is that notion. So the United States has the stated policy of Germany first, or Europe first is the other way that it's put. It's in all the documents. If you read most history books of the Second World War, you will say the United States fights Germany first. And you will even have Franklin Roosevelt, who's president, where all these decisions are being made, says absolutely that Germany first is the kind of war that we should be fighting. And to a certain degree, he even says to his high level military officers in private meetings, okay, we should be, what are we doing to put the Germany first into to action? And I just assumed that was the US strategy. But then take a look at what they do. If you look at, and how the war was won is trying to be, you know, take something very exciting and make it very boring. It moves away from sort of soldiers moving troops on maps and like in some kind of 
wargaming way and just looks at the flows of the production and deployment of equipment, just looking at how they go from theater to theater, how they're made and how they're sent across. If you look at the war from that way, just in terms of the equipment flows, the most remarkable thing is at no point does the United States fight Germany first. At no point in the war is the United States sending anything like a majority of its equipment to fight Europe. It's basically, in 1942, they actually fight a Japan first war. So in 1942, the United States is sending far more equipment to fight Japan than it actually is to fight Germany. And then in 1943, 44, what happens is it's about 50-50. I mean, there, there are different ways you can calculate things, but if you're going to divide it up, basically the Army and the Air Force send more to fight Germany, but the Navy fights overwhelmingly against Japan. And if you want to be a real economic nerd and divide it up into production categories, it's approximately 50-50. And what that means is actually the war is not Germany first. The United States might say it is, but what they're doing is fighting in many ways quite an ad hoc chaotic war that whenever equipment becomes available, they sort of say, okay, where does this go? Okay, we're going to send this to here and we're going to send that to there. And so there's no plan. And why are they doing this? Because there's a much weaker link between the eventual aims of US strategy in the Second World War and the, the means and, and ways that they have to reach that. What actually are the aims of the United States in the Second World War? That's an interesting question. Can anyone tell me? Well, Franklin Roosevelt never says beyond very broad principles what this war is about. Mm -hmm. He actually never lays out a concrete idea of what the war is about, partly because I don't think he really does have a clear vision beyond the United States winning the war and hopefully getting along. I mean, he wants a very broad, a cooperative world where the great powers can continue to get along. But beyond that, there isn't actually what I would say a concrete aim in his strategy beyond defeating Nazi Germany and Japan and then seeing what the world does after that point. That's because he sees himself as personally important. In fact, I would argue that in many ways, Roosevelt sees his own personal role in this as more important almost than the national aim. That Roosevelt's so wrapped up in his own personal role in the diplomacy with Churchill, with Stalin, and with how he sees America coming out of the war, that he confuses national purposes with his purposes, with his aims. And what this means is that he's fighting a very political ad hoc war. Okay, this equipment, he's not trying to put in place a strategy. Um, and he's trying to, to do whatever he wants. So what, why does he do what he does? He does it for so many reasons. You might say selfish motives, political motives. One of the reasons he decides never to fight Germany first in reality is because politically they can't make it look like they're ignoring the Pacific because of Pearl Harbor. So this is what I meant when we talked about chaos, that there is no consistent U.S. strategy in the Second World War. I can't see any clear sets of aims. I can't see one coherent set of ways. It seems to me there's a bunch of different ways, depending on whether you're fighting in the Pacific or fighting in, in Europe. And so if you're going to sit down and write American strategy, it has to be far more unstructured than books like to say it is. And so that, that's what I mean by the chaos theory of strategy. I think we're also already right in the middle of the overlap between strategy and narratives, mm -hmm. it seems to me, in the sense that there's an official narrative that Roosevelt tells people, which is, you know, goes by the name Germany first. Then there's a clearly a autobiographical narrative mm -hmm. that underlies the, the official narrative and is just as important, maybe more important to what he's actually doing. But then there are also lots of kind of smaller micro narratives at all the different levels of the military where people actually have to weigh up different options of what do we do with the limited means that we have where do we deploy them and where do we get an outcome that's a good outcome and these are also narratives that you tell you know you tell a little story about what happens if that's a narrative about what happens in mm -hmm. the future if you're talking about the making of u.s grand strategy in the second world war we're talking really about six or seven white guys it's a very small group of people that make U.S. grand strategy. And it's often not the ones that you think. People talk about people like the Secretary of State, Cordell Hall, or even the Secretary of War, Henry Stimson. And, and I would argue they're quite tangential because they don't actually see Roosevelt a lot. The people who matter are Roosevelt, his Joint Chiefs of Staff, and Harry Hopkins. These are the people he keeps close. Now, what's interesting about them as a group? Every one of them has a different agenda. There is no 
consensus across them about how the war should be fought. Now, let's take Roosevelt. Roosevelt's a fascinating character. I actually, in many ways, respect Roosevelt hugely. But Roosevelt does, I think, cross the line between strategy making, national interest, and personal aggrandizement a number of times in the war, most amazingly at the end. What is the most selfish decision of a grand strategist in the Second World War? And I don't mean crazy. You know, Hitler, you might say, makes many crazy choices. But what is the single most selfish? And that's when Roosevelt decides in 1944 to run for re-election when he's dying. He shouldn't do this. He's dying in 1944. He can barely work. If you go look at Roosevelt's schedule in early 1944, he basically takes off January, February, March, and most of April. He cannot work those months. He's hardly in the office. He's resting. This is an era before blood pressure medications. I mean, he's really sitting there dying and unable to work. And part of him knows this. That's another thing that's remarkable, that when he talks to some of his confidants, he doesn't trust many people, Franklin Roosevelt, but he trusts a few. And for some of them, he sort of does start wondering, am I dying? Is this the end? Even though he's in such terrible shape and cannot work, he decides he needs to run for re-election in 1944. Now, I think that's incredibly selfish. And I think his worry is all he has now is to keep this great role going in the war. And not only does he run for re-election when he shouldn't in 1944, he chooses as a vice president somebody who he will not involve in his personal counsel. He chooses Harry Truman. Now he chooses Truman to get re-elected, but then he doesn't involve Truman in policy. So Truman has no idea even of the atom bomb. Vice President of the United States has no idea the United States is building an atom bomb. And that's because Roosevelt, who is dying, partly knows that, refuses to share secrets with the person who will almost certainly become president in the second term. That's an extraordinarily selfish thing to do. And it could have been disastrous. And Roosevelt then promptly dies. He dies in April of 1945, not long after he becomes president, you know, after the inauguration in January of 45. So when we're dealing with these decisions, we're dealing with people who are making very odd, very personal choices. And it's interesting how those clash within the system to create grand strategy. So grand strategy is partly a clash of very personal, selfish you might say preconceived notions. These are all people who have very set notions on how they think war should be waged and and they're very different. I mean, someone like George Marshall, the head of the army, couldn't look at war any differently than William Leahy, who's, who's Roosevelt's chief of staff. And so the war ends up being a clash between them. What comes out is in many ways, therefore, the result of a series of bureaucratic battles. They have these sort of constant battles. And that's what strategy is. But yes, the personal, the selfish, all of that works. And that, by the way, goes to the other. I mean, one of, I think, the oddest things about Second World War grand strategy is that for all of the quote unquote war leaders, and that's dictators or not dictators, that's Churchill to Hitler to Stalin to Mussolini, the personal gets mixed up with the political all the time. In many ways, Stalin judges communism by whether you agree with Stalin. (laughs) Stalin says, I'm fighting for world communism, but Stalin's vision of communism is Stalin's vision. So yes, you're fighting for world communism as long as it's world communism is exactly the type Stalin say it is. So you can't separate Stalin from communism by what he's fighting for. And I would say you know, Churchill's hankering after the British Empire is fascinating because in many ways, it's far more than the British people. So if we're looking at what do the British people want out of the Second World War? Well, actually, what we find out is what the British people want out of the Second World War is a national health service and a welfare state. The British people are moving in this way against great powerdom. That they look at the Second World War as, as almost a cosmic break in what they will be, whereas Churchill is fighting the war for the exact opposite reasons. Churchill is fighting the war to maintain the British Empire, whereas the British people are heading in a very different direction. So you're bringing out some really fascinating things here, Phil, about the sort of the gap between how we like to visualize strategy making and how it really occurs and, and takes place in a much more chaotic fashion. And I think one of the things that's interesting me about this is with my work on the ancient world, I'm quite used to reading texts where 
generals are sort of heroized for their very, very individualistic strategy making. Now, actually, in reality, behind the scenes, they might have been making much more collective decisions, but the stories that are told are focused very much on the individual. And the picture that you're painting here is, is somewhat different from that, in a sense, in that the reality is that there are lots of these individual pushes and pulls and individual tensions. But is it the case, do you think, that the public during the Second World War assume there's a much more collective strategy making process that's more successful than it really is? How do you think contemporary people were visualising strategy making as either a very individualistic method or something that governments were doing together, that political leaders were doing together with all sorts of experts coming in and so on? It's a really good question about public opinion in all of this. I've been quite heavily influenced in the in a few years about looking about public opinion on war. A lot of it is work that's come out of Peter Fever and Richard Gelpie in the States. In many ways, it's quite subversive. It's not very positive to human nature. But what they say is the crucial groups in society about war, they really don't care about the war per se. They just care about winning it. They're not motivated by saving their neighbors' lives. They're not motivated by not committing war crimes. There's a large group of society, usually the decisive swing groups in society. They're motivated by, is this war winnable? And by winning, they really mean conquering the other side, having a victory parade and feeling good about yourself, having a sort of celebration. It's just one of those views. And, and I think that's when you look at a lot of Second World War popular reaction, the key thing for the popular opinion is to, to see, is this war a winnable war? Only when the populations are absolutely convinced the war is not winnable do they start to turn against it. So in Italy, it happens very early. The population decides the war is not winnable, which is why something like the Battle of Britain, it's very important for Churchill to convince the population the war is still winnable. But as long as they believe a war is winnable, a population will, I think, not with any great understanding of what the strategy is or what they want out of the war, they will support it almost to win the war, and then they can decide after the celebrations what is going on with the war. And so I, I do see that. I think it provides a different, you know, there are certainly political differences within the populations in the Second World War. The Germans, by the way, don't understand that. I think one of the most interesting things, you know, the, the Germans in the Second World War really don't tend to understand that other populations have political ideas and political opinions. So when Hitler goes into the Soviet Union, most famously, he could have undermined the Soviet population support for the war by, say, going to the Ukrainians and we're going to free. I mean, it would have all been a myth anyway, because he had no, had no intention of it. But they don't even play the, the right political game of trying to undermine popular support. All they do is make popular support in the Soviet Union go stronger for Stalin because they act like such you know, barbaric ethnic cleansers. They don't take into account these things. And indeed, you know, Russian public opinion becomes this fascinating in the war. It might have cracked in 1941, and certainly in parts of the Soviet Union, had the Germans done things differently. But what the Germans do is they create this need, and, and the, you know, the Russians are saying, we have to win. You know, we're going to do everything we can to win. The result, if we don't, is too large. So popular opinion matters. I don't think it's actually as rationally thought out. I think it's an instinctive thing in reaction to the prospects of victory or not. That's the interrelationship. And then they'll let the grand strategists get on with it as long as they provide enough hope of victory. So when they stop doing that, that it becomes a problem. As far as popular opinion goes, then strategy making is not necessarily seen as a form of expertise, but as something more instrumental. It is. I mean, even in democracies, and, and we can look at this, by the way, in the last 30 or 40 years, what, what has been fascinating about public opinion after the Second World War for countries like the United States and the United Kingdom, both who have been regularly involved in world wars, is that none of those wars are existential wars. The United States and the, and the United Kingdom have fought many, many wars since 1945. At no point were any of them existential, unless you were talking about a possible nuclear exchange with the Soviet Union. But if you're talking about wars from Malaya to Korea to Vietnam to Iraq to Afghanistan to wherever, you know, Kosovo, none of them were ones that threatened the existence of the state. How then did the population react to these wars? Well, there's a quite a consistent pattern to it. And it has 
uh, and I don't want to say it works like this in every case throughout, almost immediately when a war starts, there's strong, strong public support for it. There's sort of this rally around the flag, absolutely independent of strategy. Prime minister has said we must go to war. President says we must go to war. And you get significant support going on to the first part. It's only as the wars go on that you sort of have the beginning of popular disquiet to go into these wars. And why do people turn against it? This becomes, and, and why do some stay with it? Well, we can say in certain cases, there are certain people who are going to stay with every war no matter what. There seem to be about a third of them. If you look at the United States and Vietnam, even British public opinion, like in Iraq, when it got very negative in, in 2006, six seven, there's always a third of people. They just support any war at any time. It's just amazing. It doesn't matter how you know, the, the war is going badly and all of that. There's about a third of the people who in many ways maybe just like war. You know, they, they like to, to, to see this going on. They like pictures of the equipment. They like military um, ideals and, the, and they always support it. The rest of the people really, and, and they're the ones who go back and forth, tend to be torn in a number of different directions about public opinion. And, and, but it's not on the strategy chosen per se, I would think, that, that defines that other two thirds of the population. There's now a, the significant that will not support war at any time, maybe five to 10 percent. That, that's maybe somewhat different is, you know, there is now a significant percentage of the population that will, that will not support wars. Um, but really, 50 to 60 percent, percent, which is that large group in the middle, will support wars often to begin with and then move away. And it's why they move away. And they move away for a bunch of reasons. And I think primarily the key one is, as I mentioned earlier, victory. Then you know, they like war to begin with. It's all great. Flags come out. Parades happen. But then they don't like losing wars. So this test for them is a strategist who can say to them, we're going to win this war. The most important example of that recently is, I think, looking at the United States in the Iraq War during the, the, the War on Terror, not the first Gulf War, but the second Gulf War. That the, that's originally the United States leading the coalition of the willing, which is actually not that large of a coalition, into Iraq after 9-11 on the false pretenses of WMDs. To begin with, they get to Baghdad, the flags fly, Saddam's statue is toppled, mission accomplished. You know, it, it's very popular war. And then all of a sudden people realize the war's not over. Um, and, and, and indeed what they've done is unleashed a disaster in Iraq because they've created chaos on the ground in Iraq and Iraq spirals out of control. And the US seems powerless to do anything to do it. In fact, they've made things worse in Iraq. And then presented with this situation, what does the Bush administration do? And popularity really drops precipitously between 2004 and 2006, when you look at the United States and, and the Iraq war. And what does Bush do? Well, he says, we either have to come up with a strategy of winning this war, that's it. And it's not the so much, and he comes up with the famous surge, which is in some ways public relations phrasing. But it was very much strategy to appeal to the population to simply say to them, look, we have a chance to win. Because I think what they've realized is the American people believe the war is lost about 2005, six, and then they're against it. Do the American people understand more than there's a major insertion of US troops? Probably not. You know, they don't understand the, the, the intricacies of, of the policy or anything like field manual 324. But what they do understand is American forces there and it seems to stabilize the situation, and that stabilizes public opinion. Doesn't actually rise it back up, but it keeps it from eroding any further. I think that was the most interesting example of how public opinion is moved, but it does seem very much dependent on that idea of, can you at least win this war or have a chance of winning this war? Whereas Afghanistan, it's just continued on down because there doesn't seem to be any way to, to win Afghanistan. And that's finally what the Biden did administration has said, you know, there's no way beyond permanent occupation. We basically become Robin legionnaires and set up the U.S. Army permanently in Afghanistan. That's the only way to do it. And we're not willing to do that. And so therefore, best get out. Of course, that took 18 years. It seems to me that we are again kind of getting into very interesting areas of overlap between strategy and narrative. Start with a certain narrative of the war, which feeds into the strategy or that the strategy might mm -hmm. be that narrative that people subscribe to and then things develop 
and there's a gulf between you know the, the initial narrative and how things are going then you have to adapt sometimes you can do that sometimes you can't and one of the things i found particularly interesting about what you were saying there phyllis uh, how bush was drawing actually on a completely different kind of discourse which is pr and advertising and is, is using concepts ideas phrases that people are familiar with to build those into his strategy slash narrative <laughs> to try and keep the support going for this military enterprise. All war is sold to the people through phrases and emotional appeals and trying to put it in the light. I mean, you have to say the most successful of this is what Nazi Germany does in a clearly losing war from 43 to 45. Mm -hmm. One of the amazing things is they keep the German people thinking there's a chance of winning this war through talking of total war, wonder weapons, you know, all this kind of fortress Europe they create visions of something that don't exist. Europe isn't a fortress. There are no real wonder weapons coming through. <laughs> that the idea of total war is itself, I think, quite an interesting one. But that they create through the use of phrasing within the German people hope that only if we commit ourselves more will we have a chance and we can win the war. So that's something that goes on in all wars. The creation of you know, that, that use of phrasing to sell the war uh, to the people. I think what the Bush administration, the problem that they had, and, and what they don't do is, of course, reverse public opinion, is they are just left with two thirds of the people who by not 2006, who they really are stuck with them against it. They are willing, by the way, to make strategy there for a sort of political end. If I was going to say one of the biggest problems I have with a lot of international relations ideas, be it realism, whatever, is they're based on the notion of the national interest. And maybe I'm an old cynic now, but if I would say the more I've come to it, the less I believe there is anything that we can call a national interest. The national interest of people should all be to be Denmark. You know, who are the happiest, wealthiest, healthiest people in the world? It isn't to be a member of the, you know, one of the great powers. The Americans have one of the lowest life expectancies of, of any people in, in the Western alliance. The, if you're talking about really what is national interest, if you're an average person, you want to live a prosperous, peaceful, healthy life and not be involved in this. Like we want to be places like Denmark. That's what's in the national interest. But instead, we create this notion that we must do all these things militarily out of, quote unquote, national interest. And really, I think that national interest is more in, an interest of serving the state. The state likes to believe it's important that it be big and powerful. And politicians like that too, because that gives them a role. I mean, don't discount the fact that politicians want to play roles internationally and be powerful. So you have this interest to create a myth of a national interest. And strategy serves the myth as much as it, more so than it would I would like to the reality of what people's lives. Some more very interesting things coming out here. So we're building a picture of strategy as something that is informed, influenced by public opinion or the need to keep public on side or bring public on side, informed perhaps by sort of values, ideals, ambitions, as much as it is a tool that helps you get through means and ways to ends. I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about how definitions or understandings of strategy as a form of expertise, as something that you do, have changed over time. Are ideas of strategy in the early modern period, for example, different from ideas of strategy in the 20th century? That's a really interesting question. That I would say that one of the primary differences is that we should, though we don't always do, understand that the only real strategy is grand strategy and everything else is tactics. Why do we still blur the line? Well, until the 20th century, the people making grand strategy were usually also the people often leading the armies. So that Napoleon, in the person of Napoleon, is both the grand strategist and fighting battles. Classical period, it's when Alexander is leading his army in the field, he's both a grand strategist and a strategist. That's the same for Alcibiades. That's the same really until we might say Augustus begins to separate himself out from active command of the army in the fields after he defeats Anthony. But even then, the Roman emperors often take the field. For, you know this far better than I do. So I think one of the issues we have is strategy in the past, it was connected to winning battles. You, you, know, you win a battle, that wins you the war, that secures your aims. And that's very much the Clausewitzian notion, that you fight the battle to win the war, and winning the war, you can then achieve your aim. 
what happens with one, you have to separate out the people making the battle decisions from the grand strategy. Franklin Roosevelt doesn't make a single battle decision in the Second World War. Neither does Winston Churchill or, or, or I mean, you might say Stalin and Hitler dabble in it usually disastrously, but most grand strategists remove themselves almost entirely from that. They're not worried about how battles are fought. They're not even deciding much about where they're fought. Roosevelt, his role is, okay, you can invade France in 44. Where you invade, it's up to you, Eisenhower. You can invade Normandy, you can invade Calais, you can try to invade anywhere you want. And so we need to separate those out. And I think that is a very important understanding because what it means is stop obsessing about battle. Battle is nothing. In fact, in many ways, even winning battles doesn't achieve your aims. I'm not sure winning battles wins you war. You don't win wars through winning battles. Now, this might sound like a very odd thing to say, but actually often you know, battles themselves are indecisive. They don't have any clear-cut result. Wars are won through more long-term processes as opposed to an analysis of each individual engagement. So if I would say that's the big change in strategy, it's one that's really accelerated in the last 200 years. The, the idea that we have to separate strategy from tactics at a higher level. And I would argue the only strategy is grand strategy. Everything else is serving that grand strategy. You might have grand tactics, high level tactics, but it's not strategy. That takes us back very interestingly to some conversations we've had with earlier podcast guests. And I'm thinking particularly of our interview with Mike Martin, a former officer in the British Army, but also an author who wrote, for example, An Intimate War, which is a history of Helmand province. And in his experience, the tension between grand strategy and tactics really became very real because as we've talked about, grand strategy becomes as much a narrative as anything else. And the narratives, the policy making in government circles at the highest levels, the grand strategy around Afghanistan bared very little relation to the conflict that was actually going on on the ground, which was all sorts of intertribal conflict. And so the clash between the two, the sort of the grand strategy completely misunderstanding the battles that were being fought meant that there was a real tension the tactics had to adapt but didn't adapt because they were somehow entrained to the grand strategy and Mike talks about this at length in his book but yeah that's one of the problems when you do separate the two although I can see the argument for separating the two conceptually. I mean in many ways they have almost nothing to do together for Britain in the war on terror and what do I mean? Well the great grand strategic decision as to why the United Kingdom goes to war in Afghanistan and Iraq you know, it's a sort of combined decision by Tony Blair after 9-11 is simply for the grand strategic reasons that he believes and he and his cabinet or he and his closest advisors believe the United Kingdom to be relevant in the world must remain the United States closest ally. The grand strategy has nothing to do with Afghanistan or Iraq. It's a grand strategic choice that Britain's position on the world can only be maintained if it acts as the United States' closest ally. It needs to be, I would argue, this mythical bridge. It's not really a bridge, but it needs to feel that it's this bridge between the United States and Europe and America's closest ally. And that's the grand strategy. It's all about high political people like Blair saying, how do I maintain our relevance and importance in the world? Not really about the British people per se in any way. So the military is told, okay, you're going to take part. We're going to do this. And they do. They fight these wars and then they're with a completely different set of situation. Okay, how do we fight these wars? We're achieving the thing of being the US's number one ally, but then when we're there, what do we do? Well, that's why you end up with all this chaos on the ground. Well, do you want to fight aggressive? No, then okay, stay in base. Well, that doesn't seem to be work well. So that they almost make a lot of short-term chaotic tactical decisions about the way they fight because the grand strategic aims are out there and they've been already understood, but they're completely unrelated to how they fight the war as long as it's seen as they're America's closest ally. So I think that's a, that's a brilliant example. I guess one follow-up question I have on this immediately is, so if, if the grand strategy is not primarily, maybe sometimes not even to the largest extent sort of based on an analysis of the situation, what is it that influences the people who make the grand strategy? What, how do they come up with these plans? Clearly, they must be working within sort of traditions of thinking about Britain's place in the world, narratives of how we should act in the world, what kind of role we should be playing. So where does this come from? Where, where do the influences on the people who make the grand strategy come from? 
Well, that's a really good point. In many ways, like now, Blair had no military history, no, no military background about how a war should be fought. So he made the decision about the grand strategy in the war. And then the how they fight it becomes a constant political bidding war between military advisors and those on the ground. And it can go in, in different ways. And by the way, the other problem with the separation is then the grand strategy ends up being redundant and no one knows what to replace it with. I think the most important example of this is take a look at the United States and the quote unquote war on terror. What was the Bush administration's aim going into that war? Grand strategic aim. Well, I've heard a bunch of reasons from finding WMDs in Iraq to remaking the entire Middle East in the American image to punishing Al Qaeda and you know, attacking Islamic thinking that it doesn't like. So you have this huge range of supposedly grand strategic reasons. By the way, which ones really mattered? It's very hard to say. It's not clear. I mean, there are certain people in the Bush administration who obviously had different perspectives. So you'd say even in grand strategically, they start the war. It's not entirely clear what they want out of it, particularly with the decision to invade Iraq. But it has to become clear three or four or five years into it is whatever the original reasons are, they're all dead. There are no WMDs. You have not remade the Middle East as American image. In fact, it's all spiraling out of control. You've made Islamic group thinking you don't like probably more popular <laughs> throughout. So you've absolutely destroyed all the grand strategic notions that you went into the war with. But then you can't replace it because you're stuck in the war so that you end up with this almost permanent war that's taken 20 years to work itself out when now there's no connection back to the original grand strategy. So when, when people were talking about should the U.S. pull out or not pull out of Afghanistan, almost none of the arguments were about what theoretically were driving them in 2001. The arguments were like, we owe it to the Afghani people, which the United States certainly has an obligation to the Afghani people, but that wasn't why they went in. And so I think that's what I mean about chaos, that the aims themselves can be so confused and then they become redundant and we end up with almost this war that's going on and you end up with a lot of short-term decisions that are made to prolong it. I mean, you would have thought there wouldn't have been a political strategist, grand strategist, more different than George Bush than, than a Barack Obama. Obama runs for president in 2008, basically saying, I will do everything differently. I will close Guantanamo. I'll try to get rid of the wars. I'll get out of Afghanistan. Basically, he runs to completely change the grand strategy of the United States in the war on terror. What does he do? Well, basically, 90% of what he does is pretty similar to what the Bush administration did. <laughs> I guess his yeah. program is itself a grand strategy, right? So you get the mm -hmm. same kind of dynamics Mm -hmm. that, that you get with the grand strategy for the war when somebody runs for office. You, you start with this narrative and then, mm -hmm. you know, these things kind of fall well, or you Or you realize actually you run into problems. How do you close Guantanamo? I remember he said I would close Guantanamo within a year or within the, that they were once elected that he would close Guantanamo Bay, but still there when, when he leaves office eight years later. And one of the first appointments he makes or remakes is to keep on the chief of defense that the previous administration had. He then retrospectively explains is an important part of policy making. And he brings almost an equivalent of the Bush surge in Iraq he brings to Afghanistan. So you know, the, the surge in Afghanistan happens under Obama's presidency, which is very similar. So I suppose we're talking a little bit now about how history ends up repeating itself. And, and that takes me on to another question, which is about our interest in the study of past strategy. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of investment in the study of historic strategy making, you know, going all the way back to the ancient world. And I suppose my question is about the role of those past histories, those past narratives, and the influence they continue to have today on later generations, on military decision making. So thinking about the military history that you specialize in or that you've studied, would you say that past models of strategy making or ideas about historic strategies have been heavily influential? If you're talking about often the UK American tradition, until recently, a lot of them tended to be private school educated public school boys. Franklin Roosevelt and Winston Churchill are quite similar to that. And they both read Thucydides and uh, had their notions of Athens versus Sparta and war strategy and did like to, and they were heavily influenced by that. 
you know, they read they read a lot of the same texts, the more modern texts like Mahan, and they were influenced by that. So you would say certainly to a, a certain kind of Western, often privately educated grand strategist, yes, the past is something that they are in their own minds quite well acquainted with, and they have their own vision of it. Certainly, I think for uh, you know, what do they what do they talk about? Often those they'll start with Thucydides in the ancient world. That is a, well, I mean, if you're looking at the first, we would say, well-developed grand strategic clash in terms of what's written, you would have to say Athens versus Sparta is a grand strategic clash. And it's one where you have two different cultural visions of strategy that are given away. The democratic Athens, the oligarchic militaristic Sparta, and that they follow these two kinds of clashing strategies. And that is certainly one that people say they gain lessons from and which they say comes forward. I'm not sure they actually do, but, and then of course, Rome, someone like Churchill would have loved his Roman history. And, but the, the Roman one is a fascinating example of strategy that what is Roman strategy? At least the Peloponnesian War is a slightly condensed time period where you could say the states represents them, the Rome of... 300 BC is so different than the Rome of 100 AD. Are they fighting anything like Roman strategy? It's sort of hard to say. But I think, yes, the, the, the people do talk about these references, often more depending on their background. That's a very American, European thing. I mean, the Japanese are certainly fighting their own Second World War very much on their strategic preconceptions that aren't very heavily influenced. They're influenced by Japanese past and, and, and more sort of East Asian past. China would have its own intellectual traditions, which influences their strategy. So as a point, yes, people are influenced from the past. They're influenced as much by characters of the past as they are, we would say, from what actually happened in the past. I think it's partly to whether we have a good understanding of what. When you look at Athens and Sparta, does Thucydides actually really understand Spartan Athenian grand strategy? He has a certain vision of it. I wouldn't know enough to say if he actually he did grasp what they were doing. Or is there an Athenian grand strategy? I mean, is it Alcibiades? Does he choose to invade Sicily, which seems to me the pivotal strategic choice they make in the Peloponnesian War is the invasion of Sicily? That does seem to come up relatively rapidly. It's not a long-term goal of Athens to invade Sicily. It's one choice they make in a very short period of time, it seems to be, very much in terms of the political dynamic of Athens. And before you know it, they have 10,000 soldiers on ships and basically throw all their money into invading Sicily. It's a bit like Franklin Roosevelt making up policy in the Second World War as it goes along. So in that sense, yes, they are doing classical. It's just not the classical we might think about. Alongside those classical narratives, could you identify all sort of um, more modern iconic narratives that maybe have a similar status or have gained a similar status? You'd think that maybe the, the big world wars might mm. have something to do with it, but also the big failures like the Vietnam War or the sure. Korean War, things like this. Are these things you think that have kind of taken on a similarly important influence on how people think about strategy now when they have to decide about what to do about a war or not? Well, there's a few really interesting things. If I was going to say, what is the great growth of a strategic area, which is highly controversial, it's this whole idea of counterinsurgency strategy. Now, counterinsurgency strategy by 2010 is in many ways the hottest thing going on, all this debate. And it represents over a century of growth of strategy about how does one fight counterinsurgency battles, as if this is a thing. Let's look at counterinsurgency strategy. That in the 19th century, whenever a Western imperial power fights a counterinsurgency campaign, they invariably win. And by the later 20th century, early 21st century, whenever they fight it, they invariably lose. Why is that? Well, it's not actually the strategy. This is one of the problems with strategy. I mean, you could imply that you know, in, in the 19th century, you're fighting these wars. You have the technological advantage now, but you're fighting it a political war where the people you're trying to control are not at that point, I think, organized enough to fight you off in most cases. But they are by the mid 20th century. They're all of a sudden then able to conceive a victory. So no matter what you do, you're going to lose these wars now. So in many ways, counterinsurgency strategy is a fraud. 
you can't win. You, you could put Alexander the Great in charge of the U.S. Army in Vietnam. It's not going to win that war. Or you could have them fight in Afghanistan and Iraq for 20 years. They're not going to win that war. They're not going to win the war because enough Afghanis don't want them there. The Vietnamese don't want them there. So that's what I would say. There's often a disconnect in our historical discussion over strategy as if these things apply at all times. Counterinsurgency, you might say, has some success in the 19th century because of people's expectations of whether they can win or not. I think in many cases, they didn't fully expect they could beat a Western imperial power. Now they know they can. Mm -hmm. And and that's the issue that they will beat the West, even though in many ways, the technological gap is larger now than it is in 1890. You know, in 1890, insurgents could have small firearms. They wouldn't have machine guns or anything like that so that the, the European power would have a technological advantage, a significant one, which would help it win battles. But right now, the technological gap between the United States and the people fighting in Afghanistan is much larger than that gap was. And yet the U.S. is, is not winning these wars. So it's not a strategic question, I yeah. would argue. I don't think it's, it's deeper than that. That makes me think of two things that we were talking about earlier as well. One is mm. what you were saying also about the Germans as they go into Russia, that they don't even make an effort to try to create a narrative that might help achieve their aims mm. there. That in turn made me think of Hannibal when he goes into Italy. He tries to do exactly this. He tries to create a narrative and a narrative that would appeal especially to many of the Greek people living mm. there of him coming in as somebody who is an alternative to Rome and who you know presents lots of advantages. It doesn't work out in the end, but that's linked to what you were saying also, that war is often not just about battles because Hannibal is very successful initially and it doesn't work out in the end. The US now, they have all this huge arsenal and still mm. that doesn't decide the war. So there's an overlap between these elements of war that have nothing to do right away with battle mm. or straight away. And that's, uh, for me, that's a very interesting element of all of this. Well, I think that's absolutely right. I don't think battles win wars. What I don't even know is how you should define a battle. Classical definition of a battle is probably the stupidest definition we could come up with. The winner of a battle is the person in control of the field at the end of the day. Well, the U.S. Army then has not lost a single battle since 1945. They've been in control of the field wherever they want to be at any time. How many wars have they won? So I don't think battle is at all the way to understand war now. Mm -hmm. I don't think engagement even. I mean, the problem is that's what militaries think about. They think about engaging. How do we send our soldiers with our equipment and fight and kill the enemy? But that's not how you win a war. I mean, quite clearly now you win a war by making the other side politically accept what you want. That's how you win a war. But in certain cases, that's shown to be almost impossible. The picture you're painting here then is that a lot of strategic thinking is perhaps sometimes stuck in ruts, stuck with concepts of battle that are perhaps out of touch. You've just said battles don't win wars, but some of what you're saying suggests that strategy also doesn't win wars. It might win people over to wars, but it doesn't help actually win wars because there's such a disconnect and there's so much chaos in the picture. I mean, there are certain wars that are not winnable unless you actually want to kill everybody. The United States can win Vietnam if it wants to kill all the Vietnamese. <laughs> yeah, it, it could commit war crimes on an even vaster scale and then go ahead and say we've won the war. Build on that, it reminds me always of my favorite Mark Twain quote, which is, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Your know, militaries are hammers, and therefore we think the way that they solve things is by hitting the nail. But we have to ask ourselves, is actually the hammer the right way to achieve what we want to achieve? I mean, so militaries are, by the way, structured in such a thing to achieve a goal, which is a military goal. But from what we can see now, military goals are very unlikely to achieve what we want to do. In fact, what would be great would be an almost a recreation of one of the most sophisticated understandings of strategy, which is Byzantine strategy. What is its strategy? Don't fight a war unless you absolutely have to. You know, try to protect what you have, buy off the other side, avoid conflict, don't risk your army. You need to maintain an army and keep it. But in fact, war is a bad thing because war can, can go down ways you don't want. And I think it would be more valuable or more understanding if people had an understanding where the, they think war actually is the last choice. The problem is people say war is the last choice. They never act like that. 
Mm. Makes me think of Augustus also, who mm. in a way anticipates this by creating this narrative by which it doesn't really matter whether you win something through military success or you win it through diplomatic success, because they're both successes. And whether you get the standards back from the Parthians through a big battle or you get it back through diplomatic negotiations doesn't matter because in the end they're hanging there on the temple and they are representations of your success. So, you know, this it's interesting to see how different people at different times have thought about war so differently. Yes. I'm sure you two know better than I would, but he sees Caesar's example and Caesar wants to be the acclaimed war leader and it gets him into obviously the situation Caesar gets into, whereas Augustus just wants to end up living a long life with power and he doesn't necessarily have that need and he understands that power is the key thing not acclamation, not being a great war leader. It doesn't matter if you have or haven't been a great war leader. It matters whether you triumph in the end and have the control and have the power. And so I, I assume that that's a, a progression of coming out of his experiences of looking at Caesar. But I think that's absolutely right. I mean, it, you might say an honest strategist is one that should be able to say the winning of the war or the use of the war is really only to achieve something and very rarely can it be achieved through a war. Just, just staying with the ancient world for a minute. So the word strategy comes from the Greek strategos general. And there's a lot of investment in the ancient world in how you train people to be successful generals yeah. and therefore how you learn strategy. So mm -hmm. fast forwarding to the 21st century, we still invest a lot, I think, in teaching strategy. Uh, and I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that and whether you think the ways in which we teach strategy today per perpetuate some of these ideas that we've been unpicking about strategy making, the importance of strategy, or whether they're actually tackling some of the problems that you've identified. First of all, I hope we are now. But one of the issues is strategy does, as you know better than I do, mean general. But I think that therefore it connects in our mind the idea of winning the battles wins the war. I mean, that's why I would reject the ancient vision of what strategy is, I think, not applicable today in terms of the strategist is the general winning the battle that wins the war. So that person to me is now today making strategy. They're just making grand tactics. The, the officers are just these tacticians fighting the engagements and they're removed from the strategy level. Whereas in the ancient world, they were so close to high politics, if not the high politics leaders themselves, that they would actually be doing both. So we need, as we said, I think to partly blow that away. That's not how wars are won and that's not what the grand strategists are. If I can say what we try to teach now, it's the entire skepticism of the connection between war and victory and achievement. That doesn't mean that all wars at all times are wrong. Clearly, a lot of people would say no. Most people would say no, not all wars at all times are wrong. But almost all wars, almost all the time are wrong. In terms of teaching it, try to actually understand what can or cannot be achieved and whether really what you think you want to achieve is something that can be achieved through war by looking at what, looking at past and looking at systems and processes. And so I think it's hopefully teaching it in a very skeptical way. Do you think the academic study of strategy, the development of war mm. studies and the study of strategy has played an important role in this? I mean, do we as academics sort of uh, are part of this feedback loop where we get a voice by studying what people have done in the past, by kind of questioning, unpicking these things and then communicating this to decision makers? Or are these different channels through which these processes have happened? It's a really interesting question. I mean, one of the things, and I've not studied it enough, but I think deserves real study, is the growth of war colleges in the 20th and 21st mm. centuries. It used to be that you know, militaries in the 19th century might have small organizational groupings and you know, maybe academies to teach you to fire your weapons and to take a few classes in military history. But what has happened in the 20th and 21st century is the explosion of war colleges where all of this is supposedly taught on almost a scientific basis and you take special courses on strategy making and war and politics and as if we are creating a class of super educated strategic warriors. That's not to say that that in and of itself is a bad thing. A lot of the work is coming out of the services themselves and therefore is based on the assumption that military force can achieve things. It's not that easy to be completely subversive to the use of force if you are talking about a military itself having a war college to study what it's done. Mm. And you have to be willing to, to challenge that intellectually. 
So where I would say the real issue in strategic studies has been is that it assumes too much is rational, logical, and a process in what it does that ends ways and means. A lot of it goes back to Clausewitz. I mean, I try to teach without reference to Clausewitz after the first week <laughs> as much as possible. I'm one of the anti-Clausewitzians because he really connects battle to victory. He has a Napoleonic vision of war. Yeah, he's writing about Napoleonic warfare. That's what he understands. Napoleon wins every battle he fights almost till 1812. He even wins the Battle of Borodino when he invades Russia and he ends up absolutely in collapse. Now, that's a very odd way then to say battle really matters. Now, you can undermine that in a whole way. What is Clausewitz not interested in at all is sea power. In terms of economic warfare, he has almost no engagement with you. He has very much the vision of a late 18th, early 19th century European officer who fights in the army. That's his vision of war. And he does talk about friction, but even then his idea of friction is, I think, in many ways, chaos in campaigns. So what you're saying is that decoupling some of the historical concepts of strategy from the modern day is very important as, as we think about it and, and being much more aware of modern realities of warfare, modern realities of international relations and so on. But I suppose also teaching strategy today also involves visualising war in the future. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that. I know you've got some interest in cyber warfare. And, you know, how does that connect up with strategy making and how we train strategy makers for the future? One of the greatest entertainment efforts in the world now and has been for, you know, since the growth of television is the portrayal of future war. Science fiction is almost entirely war-based. Science fiction movies from Star Wars, Star Trek, if you're going to go through the history of science fiction films, they're almost all war-based. And people take a lot of their ideas of war and their portrayals of war from science fiction understandings of war. How are they applicable? Are they not applicable? Because usually, of course, these things that are made are about war of their own time, not really about what war would be like any time in the future. That uh, Star Wars is about a 1970s vision of what war is like. It's certainly not what any war would be like in the future or Star Trek in any way. What I think we need to take from them is how little advancement we've partly made. Our portrayal of war is not that much different for in science fiction films and others as it would be in sort of World War II rah-rah-rah films. It really tends to be quite similar. The ones that tend to question it, I would say, are the whole genre of contemporary films. If we're talking about visualization, what's the most interesting development? It's the post-Vietnam cynical film, which for a while it looked like it was going to be the dominant ethos, but it's not anymore. It's interesting is you know, we still have films like Zero Doc 30 now, which were, were positive. But when I'm talking about what has questioned war and the portrayal of war most effectively, it's those visions that cause any kind to be questioned. They're films like MASH, the original film MASH. A lot of the films that came out of Vietnam, they're not usually the science fiction films. And more latterly, we, we've got someone coming on the podcast soon who's going mm -hmm. to be talking about citizen journalism in Syria and yep. the film industry that emerged out of that, that brought to the screens, mm -hmm. for example, the film For Sama. Those also question critique mm -hmm. in very profound ways. Where does wargaming fit in and wargaming that's actually sometimes used as a sort of form of simulation and, and teaching itself? Oh, well, that's interesting. Wargaming is based almost always on winning battles, not about winning wars. When you fight a war game, you end up saying who's basically destroyed the other side's forces or who's seized this at the end of the war game. You can't actually have a war game that properly takes in strategy because you don't know what even winning the battles, the impact will be for 10 years. So, I mean, war gaming is a very powerful tool of military learning and it's becoming more so. But it does, in my mind, accentuate the difference between winning battles and winning wars, because war games tend to be about winning an engagement. You fight a war, and at the end, you seize Baghdad and have your parade. But what they don't do is go on to the really messy work that happens after that, because that's very difficult to war game. Now, I know some people are trying to work on simulations of that kind. And one of the, the tricky ones, so it's becoming more open now is how does one game a cyber conflict? 
we don't know because we've never, on the one hand, cyber war is going on every day. But then again, we have no idea what a major cyber war would be like. Mm. Really no fields of reference. We do know that there is cyber war of some kind happening every day, be it uh, be it attacks on water facilities as happened in Israel or Israeli attacks on, on Iranian port facilities or the dark side attacks on the colonial pipeline. Those are all actually acts of war. And so that is now becoming a bit more of the understood norm. But what we don't know is what would happen in a general cyber war. Do you and, shut and- off all the power in all the cities? Do you try to shut the water to off to major cities, which would be absolutely devastating, but also would be a war crime? I mean, theoretically, you're not supposed to attack civilian infrastructure, but as we've seen in many wars, those norms often break down. And there we get into just how stark the visualization of future realities might become. And that gets us thinking again about narrative and the habits we have of visualizing war, perhaps the the habits that we enjoy sometimes of visualizing war. You talked earlier about people thinking of war as sort of boys in their toys and taking us through a much more complex picture. Interestingly, I'm actually aware of some work, and I think we're going to have some people on the podcast talking about this within the MOD of using science fiction stories um, in the future, actually to start to generate more conversation about war in the future and and strategy making. So really using sort of futures literacy and narrative there as a tool alongside what you've just talked about in terms of gaming and developing gaming as a visualization strategy. If you want to know science fiction's most exact definite influence on strategy making in the 20th century, it's that Ronald Reagan actually talked to science fiction writers when he announced the SDI Star Wars program. He said, can we come up with a a shield to stop the Soviet missile, stop a Soviet missile attack. And actually, one of the things he talked to science fiction writers like Larry Niven, I know this because I used to love reading science fiction, like Larry Niven, but he invited a group of men. They said, yes, how would we as science fiction writers conceive of a, and they came up with all these brilliant ideas. Of course, none of them actually would work. I think Reagan would have pressed ahead with Star Wars regardless of what the science fiction writers said. But certainly, I think the plans the science fiction writers came up with in the 1980s were way beyond the technological capabilities of the time. There's lots to be still very curious about how the study of of strategy will develop uh, with it. And that takes me to my last question, Phil, before we let you go. Um, what is your next project? What is happening now? <laughs> Finished your biography in 2019, as we were saying. So what's next on the, on the schedule for you? Well, I've got basically the last book of my Second World War trilogy, and then I'm done with the Second World War, and I've got to finish it in a year and a half. And that is my final sort of upper level strategy book. And it's looking at Roosevelt, Churchill, Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini by starting at their First World War experiences or even earlier, I mean, Churchill first goes to war in, in India uh, in the 1890s. So it's by looking at their earlier experiences of war as individuals and how that would argue shape their strategic mindset and what they thought war was, and then how they stamp these very personal visions of war on what their nations do in the Second World War. So it's about this idea that you know, there is no national strategy. There's strategists have their own very particular ideas of what strategy is and what war is. So by but trying to do that by looking at the experiences of the grand strategists earlier and then how they will take these and apply them to the Second World War in you know, quite profound ways that often are, are decisive in winning or losing the war because the war is their choices. Gee, just well, Hitler, for some reason, always chooses firepower over mobility. Mm. Thankfully for us, because it means the Germans lose because they don't have enough mobility, actually, a lot of the time. And you can relate that very much to Hitler's First World War experiences. Well, that sounds fascinating. And I look forward to reading this. And Phil, uh, I also want to thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's been absolutely Mm -hmm. fascinating to, to talk to you about strategy, study of strategy, and getting your insight into strategy making, ideas or visualizations of strategy, and all this complex relationship, but also you know, all these interesting thoughts about strategy and tactics and war and war and battle. It's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Phil. Well, thank you for having me, Nicholas and Alice. Thank you for having me. Yes, thank you from me. You've taken us from the ancient world very much, not just to the 21st century, but way into the future and made me think just 
you know a lot more about how very complex strategy is um, thank you also to our listeners for joining us today we hope that you've enjoyed our conversation with Philip O'Brien as much as we have Please tune in again next week when we'll be joined by curators from the Imperial War Museum London to talk about their new World War II galleries and the decisions that they've taken about how to narrate this well-known conflict in new ways for new audiences. And if you would like to support our project, please share and subscribe to the show on Apple Podcast, Spotify or whatever platform you use so you don't miss an episode. And please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcast because that really helps people find the show. And if you'd like to join the conversation further, you can follow us on social media, just search for Visualizing War, or get in touch directly by emailing us at viswar at standrews.ac.uk. Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Young. The show was mixed by Zofia Gertin. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>